This video is brought to you by Ingenious and their new Fit line. Yeah, access points, switches. This is a 10 port. Get those two ports for stacking. It makes a big difference when you're dealing with smaller things like this. Eight PoE ports plus two SFP. These types of devices that are designed to be higher end and more reliable, very, very competitive market. And I found this Fit switch to be very price competitive because it's layer two plus. You can manage it. It's got pretty good LEDs on the front for the PoE mode fault and to let you know if you're drawing too much power. You can power your cameras and your access points. It's a one gigabit switch with the gigabit uplink. It's designed to be inexpensive but still ingenious. For your home setup, like your, your pro home setup, this is a good switch for that. I've been running it for a little while and I've been really happy with what I see. Thanks Ingenious and on with the video. We're gonna build our own high availability cluster, but not from Genoa systems that I have here on my desk, but from mini PCs. Mini PCs like these, this, with a single network card, we can build a high availability cluster or a NAB6. Okay, not a NAB6, it doesn't have Thunderbolt. Well, I mean, you could do it with Thunderbolt, but I'm actually doing this with Thunderbolt, even on AMD. Although, AMD's PCIe tunneling is not Thunderbolt, and it's incomplete. AMD doesn't have people working on the Linux kernel drivers for such things. Uh, let's, let's take a closer look at our setup here and understand what it is we're doing. All right, you can kind of hear this machine struggling a little bit, sorry, but uh, I just wanted to show the awesomeness. When you get many machines like this, many PCs, these are a lot of fun because these are a lot of horsepower. There's a lot of compute horsepower in here, and they can be inexpensive, especially if you're getting older generation stuff. You know, Intel's getting out of the NUC game, and this is a 12th generation NUC. This actually does support expansion to include Thunderbolt, but this one does not have Thunderbolt. And the reason that Thunderbolt is useful is because it can provide a high-speed interface between machines that are participating in your cluster. For your home machine, your home lab stuff, chances are you live with other people or you want to do things in a way that's highly available. Maybe you're updating something and you make a mistake it takes it offline. Is it going to take out the network for everybody else? Is that going to take down your media server? Is that going to take down important stuff that you're running just when you're doing normal software maintenance? Do you even want to fool with normal software maintenance at home? Arguably, I don't, and this is how I build things so that I have to do as little maintenance as possible. I really don't want to color outside the lines too much, and I do like the idea of having something like this running my home infrastructure because it's so low power. So the cool trick you can do is to use commodity hardware like this to make up for its reliability shortcomings. I mean, yeah, those, those Genoa systems are really super nice to use in the enterprise, to use at work, basically. But at home, you know, they're loud, they use a lot of power. It's extreme maximum overkill for your home lab setup. In fact, most of these are extreme maximum overkill. But it would be nice to set it up in such a way that you have two or three machines working together, and if any one of them is down, the other ones can take over. And we're to a point where these mini machines are so powerful I mean, most of these are eight cores, 12 cores, 14 cores in some cases from Intel and AMD. And a lot of the time, these are gonna be more powerful than servers that you have at your workplace that are you know, three, four, five years old. This is gonna be able to run a media job plus home assistant for automation, plus any of the other stuff that you've set up for your home server stuff. Wireless network controller, manage multiple access points, run multiple VMs, you know, maybe you've got some thin clients or whatever scattered around your house and you, you just need access to be able to log into a virtual machine that you're hosting. Yeah, any of these are gonna be able to do that single-handedly. One of the nice things to have when you're building a high availability stack of machines like this is a high-speed connection. So our NAB6 from Minis Forum has two, two and a half gig ethernet connections. And you can use that with software that provides high availability. Free software like Proxmox or XCPNG. Okay, it's freemium, it's more correct to call that freemium. But if you've had experience with Hyper-V, or VMware or just KVM on Linux. It's the same kind of a thing. Proxmox, we've covered it before. There's a ton of videos setting up a Proxmox cluster. It's a pretty common thing to do at home. You run those Linux distributions on this hardware or VMware if you want to do the VMUG Advantage membership or, or whatever. And as long as your network cards are pretty well supported and you've got drivers and everything else, you can set all that up and it works fine. 
The problem is that two and a half gigabit is only 250 megabytes per second when we're talking about a transfer rate. And when we're talking about a cluster that's high availability, keeping everything in sync between all of the members of the cluster will only run at that relatively slow speed. So if, for example, you're running a Ceph cluster, that 45 drives did a Ceph cluster on three Steam decks, which is pretty impressive that the software is able to handle that. But that's really a relatively pedestrian one gigabit-ish connection, which is only about 100 megabytes per second. So if you're doing a lot of writes on a virtual machine or you're doing anything like that that is sort of write intensive, it's gonna be very slow because you're synchronizing that information update across a bunch of machines. And to be sure, even using these, it's still slow. It's gonna be dramatically faster, but it's gonna be slower than purpose-built hardware. These machines do actually have, well, not these, but these here on this side, do actually have a higher speed interface. Thunderbolt, that's, and that's what I was getting to, 40 gigabit. Theoretically, you could have a 40 gigabit link between these machines. You can also set up a three node cluster. This is really awesome because with Thunderbolt networking, it's really only point to point networking. With a three node cluster, you're gonna connect every node to every other node using each node's two Thunderbolt ports. It's got itself, it can connect to two other nodes. That's what we're gonna do. Oh, and by the way, this design pattern where you've got a three node cluster is really useful for two reasons. One, no single point of failure in any of the connections because every node is connected to every other node instead of like through a switch, uh, whether that's InfiniBand or Ethernet or OmniPath or whatever, every node is connected to every other node. So in terms of node to node communications, there's not a single point of failure for that to fail, which is awesome. The second reason this is really awesome, other than it being built in and you know all that stuff, of course, is that it's relatively high speed. As a software matter, it's not actually super high speed. We'll get to that in a minute. There's lots of room for optimization, but in terms of ease of use, it's there, it works, works really well. I mean, you can get 100 gigabit OmniPath Intel adapters for around $30 US. If you put two of those in a system, $60 total per system, you can have a 100 gigabit Proxmox link between all of your nodes, no single point of failure, and not actually have to shell out for an OmniPath switch. In the guide on the level one forum, I've got a little table that will help you set your interfaces and your IP addresses. Three nodes also gives you what's called a quorum. If you're familiar with VMware or anything like that, VMware is like, oh, we can do a two node cluster. You know, that's not actually technically true. You need a witness node to witness things. Proxmox can work in a, in a two node or a three node configuration, but anytime you've got clusters and high availability, it's always better to have that witness or the tiebreaker or ever how you want to refer to it for adhering to the design best practices when we're talking about high availability. Now let's go back to our particular setup. Normally with Thunderbolt, when you're plugging into say a Mac computer, which is where Thunderbolt networking comes from, this is actually the Apple IP protocol, um, the Thunderbolt kernel driver in Linux detects that there's a network interface on the other side and it will automatically uh, deploy the Thunderbolt net module. Now in the how-to, there's also a line here. I think it's probably easiest if you enable um, Thunderbolt low security, which is basically disabling Thunderbolt security, basically trusts any device that you plug into it. And that is setting one rule in your uh, uh, Etsy folder so that the kernel will just automatically deal with whatever is, is, is showing up here. The thing you gotta keep in mind with Thunderbolt is that on Linux, Linux doesn't do Thunderbolt networking out of the box. So one of your machines, you have to mod probe Thunderbolt net and then the other machine says, oh, there's a network device here and it'll bring it up. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, Thunderbolt networking on Linux, I don't, it doesn't seem like it's super well maintained. We'll talk about that more in a minute. It can be a little flaky and weird. This is definitely not a silver bullet, OMG, this is amazing solution in terms of performance or stability, but it is doable. And I think that if enough, you know, here's your audience participation uh, opportunity. I think if there are enough people interested in this kind of thing, it can get dramatically better in the next six months to a year. It's a really good opportunity for this older technology to live on and also get used in unusual ways because these cheap mini machines, I mean, you know, $300 machine with Thunderbolt is gonna be a thing for a while. And because it's gonna be a thing for a while, it sure would be nice to be able to use this hardware in a home lab scenario. I mean, this 13th gen NUC is only nine watts at idle. So way under 65 watts. At full load with all three nodes running, you might be 300 watts. 
Now this NUC is a ninth generation Intel, but also has PCIe expansion slots. I reviewed it separately. This is actually a Xeon NUC. And because this is a Xeon NUC with two two and a half gig interfaces and Thunderbolt and PCIe, it's gonna use a little bit more power, upwards of 130 watts by itself. But because our other two nodes are relatively low power, not a big deal. I'll also mention AMD really quickly. AMD has PCIe tunneling. It's not exactly the same as Thunderbolt, but it's the same idea. And in the Linux kernel, it uses the same modules. Now, a lot of those modules were originally developed by folks at Intel, but you know, Intel's got a lot of stuff that they're worried about right now that doesn't include old Thunderbolt and certainly doesn't include the relatively pedestrian. I mean, 40 gigabit for these interface speeds is uh, positively pedestrian at this point. And so no one, is using it for this use case or testing it for this use case or really maintaining it um, for this use case. And there's nobody at AMD that's really doing anything with it because Thunderbolt Net won't actually work on our AMD Ryzen 7000 series machines. But both B-Link and Minis Forum have some great machines that can work really well for this purpose in addition to our 13th gen Intel NUC or even our 12th gen Intel NUC as long as you get the optional Thunderbolt interface to go with it. Once you get this physically cabled with every node connected to every other node, it is a good idea to go ahead and set up Proxmox. You set up Proxmox on each individual node. Don't be tempted to go ahead and set up the cluster. We need to not do that. Once you got Proxmox configured, I, I would recommend naming each one something like NUC1, NUC2, NUC3 if you don't know exactly what you're doing. You might have to check out our other content on setting up a Proxmox cluster and setting up some of the fun stuff with Proxmox, but we're just gonna talk about very basic stuff here. Because every node is connected to every other node through Thunderbolt, this is a whole bunch of network interfaces that don't actually connect at a network level. It is networking, but it's not really networking. It's really a more point-to-point -point link. You have to think of it like a point-to-point -point link. And each machine has two Thunderbolt interfaces, so it's like two network interfaces that go two different places. So I've got my little table in the how-to on the level one forum of uh, you know some example names and IP addresses that you can set for your Thunderbolt interface. Now to be sure, your ethernet interface should still be what you expect it to be for your network. So like if you're on a 192.168.1 network, you know, you could number them, you know, like 234 or 567 or 10, 11, 12, whatever makes sense for your ethernet interface. For your Thunderbolt interface, you want that to be a completely separate network than everything else. And you're gonna end up with a bunch of separate networks, uh, three separate networks actually, that each machine is connected to, to connect directly to each other machine. So if you SSH in and you mod probe and you don't get your Thunderbolt 0 and Thunderbolt 1 interface, uh, it's troubleshooting time. You may have to come to the level one forums and, and go with it from there. Once you get Thunderbolt Net loaded and you can see the interfaces, you can set the IP addresses through the Proxmox GUI. That's completely fine. You can also use command line tools on Linux if that's what you'd rather do. Configure the interfaces and just run simple ping commands and make sure that you can ping those IP addresses from one node to the other node. Now the next thing that you have to do, which is not something really super well supported by PVE proxy, which is a thing that runs when you're actually setting up a Proxmox cluster, is the IP addresses that are resolved when you ping your machine's names. So like if you name these NUC1, NUC2, NUC3, you SSH into NUC2, you should be able to ping NUC1 and NUC3. The interesting thing is that you don't want to use the IP address on the Ethernet side. You want to use the IP address on the Thunderbolt side. The reason for that is because when we have transfers of virtual machines or you do, you know, PVE proxy is doing its internal housekeeping, you want it to run over that theoretically should be faster Thunderbolt interface. And so you have to edit the system hosts file to have IP addresses that correspond to those names. So when you ping NUC1, it should use the internal IP address of NUC1 from NUC2's perspective, which is different on NUC3. So you're not gonna have the same hosts file on NUC1, NUC2, NUC3. It's gonna be different on NUC1, NUC2, NUC3 because each of those machines is taking a different physical path to get there. This is actually a lot to take in, but like I say, this is a useful design pattern outside of Thunderbolt. This works just as well with, with Intel OmniPath, for example. And so you could put two OmniPath adapters in a machine and physically configure it exactly as it is here and have a 200 gigabit interface between all your machines. 
It's also worth noting that, you know, again, everybody assumes, you know, 40 gigabit is actually really fast. It's not. 40 gigabit is a maximum of four gigabytes per second, but the architecture of Thunderbolt, even on our latest gen, 13th gen, even Thunderbolt 4, is it's still only 40 gigabits of internal bandwidth, which means that both of our Thunderbolt ports are sharing 40 gigabits of bandwidth. Real world, you're gonna see between 10 and 20 gigabits maximum between your nodes. The real world performance of Thunderbolt in this particular scenario with Nux on the latest kernel on Proxmox 8, actually kind of disappointing. Out of the box, you'll probably only get a gigabit or two, which is unacceptably low. Fortunately, you can do some tuning and get that to be a little bit faster. It's on the order of about 10 gigabit if you jump through some hoops, but that's, just, that's, that's probably gonna be a forum discussion kind of a thing. Once you get pinging works, you know, connect to every node, make sure you can ping every other node, reboot a few times, make sure the interfaces come up. You're ready to set up your Proxmox cluster and it'll work pretty much the normal way. Just remember not to use your ethernet side IP addresses. You actually wanna use your Thunderbolt side interfaces. And then you should be ready to create virtual machines and do whatever it else is that you need to do. If you're running the pings on this, you might've noticed, why is the ping all over the place? That is an excellent question, probably for the module maintainers or people that actually use this. And this stems from the fact that the Thunderbolt net driver is just a very, very lightweight, you know, sort of pretend network stub that was put together with bailing wire and duct tape. It can be a 20 gigabit or a 40 gigabit interface, but it's going to need some love. If you wanted to fast track your resume and say, I'm a Linux kernel contributor, there's probably some seriously low hanging fruit in terms of optimizing the Thunderbolt driver in Linux for this use case. There is no reason that kernel 6.2 out of the box pinging another kernel 6.2 node should be north of 100 milliseconds for this Thunderbolt Zero Ethernet interface. I'm actually working on that, spoiler alert, have been for a little while, just don't have a lot of time, but I don't wanna get into it in this video. But I think with a lot of people looking at this, it's probably like, oh yeah, this actually is a use case people would like, maybe this makes sense, this is something we can work on, and thus is the power of open source. If you decided that's a little too janky for you, well, maybe 100 gigabit Omnipath is just the right amount of jank at $30 a card. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. This has been a quick look at where we are with Thunderbolt networking for Proxmox clusters and mini PCs. 65 watts is a perfectly reasonable goal. I don't know that Thunderbolt is the way to get there today, but it certainly can be. It just needs a little bit more elbow grease and... Maybe, maybe somebody will want to take up that challenge. Maybe somebody will want to borrow some Nux and take up that challenge. <laughs> maybe somebody on the AMD side will want to go ahead and finish the Thunderbolt net driver and show us how it's done. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1, I'm signing out, and you can find me in the Level 1 forums.